Hello and praise the Lord. Pastor Benjamin Reynolds coming to you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I'd like to speak today on a topic that I think a lot of people need to hear about in this hour. And I want to talk about manifesting a miracle, how to look to God for help. And the reason why I'd like to speak on this topic is I think a lot of people want God to do miracles in their life. People want to see the work of God in their life. There are also times when our faith in God becomes low because we don't see his work, either because it's been a long time God's done something in our life, or there's been times when we've trusted in God to do something for us or protect us, and we don't feel like God has just come through. And so sometimes our faith can get weak. We may listen to other people who don't believe in and trust in God. We ourselves don't see God doing things. And so our faith gets weak, and we don't really believe in God doing miracles like we see in the Bible. But I want to talk about this topic and examine it and study it, because I truly believe that God is still in the miracle manifestation business. God is still blessing people. God is still doing miracles. And there's certain things that we have to do and tenants we have to follow if we want God to manifest miracles in our life. We're living in a time where we need miracles. And when times get tough, that's when God shows up and shows off the most when you look in the Bible. But if we want God to do something, specifically if we want miracles, then we need to get back to Bible principles. We need to not just read the word. We've got to study it to figure out how can we manifest the things in our life that the people in the Bible saw? Amen. I'd like to read from Second Chronicles chapter 20, and I'm going to read from verses 1 through 4. After this, the Moabites, Ammonites, and with them some of the Meonites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Verse 2 says, And some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom and from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Verse 3 says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Amen. Now, in speaking about this, I want to say it's not afraid to admit when you're, it's not, it's not a problem to admit when you're afraid. But when you're afraid, you don't want to just stay afraid. We need to learn how to seek God. Because many times in our life, we're going to face things that are bigger than us. We're going to face things that are bigger than the resources we have to solve that problem. We're going to face things that are going to make us afraid to the core, no matter who we are. The strongest of us, the richest of us, the healthier, the best of us, we are going to encounter at least once in our life something that is going to cause fear and dread to come on us. And let me tell you, in that time, you need to learn how to seek the Lord. Amen. Now, I'd like to say, number one, that Jehoshaphat and his people were facing overwhelming odds coming against them. They stood to lose everything. Jehoshaphat was afraid, and the good thing was, the first thing he did was he sought the Lord. Amen. And number two, when you are afraid, and you are facing overwhelming odds. I want to tell you right now that there are eight things, praise God, eight things that you need to do, praise God. And then I'm going to talk about three more things, amen, that to note that they also did, but specifically the eight things that you need to learn how to do if you want God to manifest a miracle in your life and how to look for help, look to God 
when you need help. Praise God. Now I'm going to read from Second Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 5 through 12. And I didn't say it before, but I am reading from the ESV version of the Bible to make things a little easier. Praise God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5 through 12 says, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O God, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations, and your hand is power, or power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you, in our affliction, and you hear, and you will hear and say, verse 10 says, And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit it. Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against their great horror that is coming against us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes, oh Lord, our eyes are on you. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Now, I've read the scripture, and I'm going to summarize the eight things that you need to do when you're seeking God to manifest a miracle. Number one, you need to learn how to seek God first for direction. This is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. When we get in trouble, we've got to, instead of getting on the phone and calling people, checking the bank account, crying and telling everybody how bad things are, you got to learn how to talk to God first. When you talk to God, God's going to bring the problem down to a size that you're able to handle it because you're going to recognize that in situations where the problem is too big for you, God has allowed the problem to come into our lives. Those of us who trust in God and serve God and believe in God, God, we know that God only allows things to come into our lives that we are able to handle and that we can, and God will not put more on us than we can bear. So when we look to God for direction, God's going to calm us down. He's going to put things in perspective and he'll give us a plan on how to handle the situation, which is usually be still and let him handle it. Number two, we need to unite and assemble the people of God when the, if it's a situation or problem that affects not just us, but our, our church, the people around us, our family, our community. We've got to get everybody involved that this problem is going to affect, and we need to come up with a plan that involves God. Because sometimes we try and handle things individually, and then everybody thinks that they know what's right. Everybody thinks that they're hearing from God. We're not working together, and things can't get solved the way that they should because God's people aren't in unity. Number three, we need to proclaim a general fast that is for those who are able to do it, okay? The Bible says that Jehoshaphat, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 4, that he proclaimed a fast. And the fast is to show God how serious. The fast is to take a step back from our normal life. The fast is to take this natural carnal wor world, put it aside, let, it, let, let ourselves know that the things in this world are important so that we can focus on something spiritual. See, when you're taking time to fast, you're pushing the flesh, you're pushing the physical back because you want the spiritual to rise up. You want the spiritual to get nourished. You want you want to push things uh, that are physically in the way aside to make it easier for God to talk to you 
and respond to things. And so we need to proclaim a fast for everybody that's able to do it to show God how serious we are and so that everybody can get on one mind, one accord, and figure out how to solve this sin. Number three, I'm sorry, number four, we need to have a congregational prayer meeting. Again, if this involves everybody, if everybody that involves needs to get together and get on one mind and one accord in prayer to talk to God and to hear from God uh, concerning what's happening. There are three things that need to happen that we need to be sure are going to happen in this prayer meeting. Number one, we need to uplift God for who he is. Second, number three. I'm sorry, in this prayer meeting, we need to be sure to uplift God for who he is. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5 through 6, it talks about how Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly in the house of God. And what did he do? He talked about how great God was. He talked about how God ruled over everything. Basically, he lifted God up and let, and let God know how great he was. And see, when we do this, when we do this, what this does is it's not just us praising God and lifting God up, but we begin to recognize as we speak this into existence, we, as we speak it, we begin to recognize ourselves that, hey, God is great and he's bigger than whatever problems come into my life. This problem has got me so scared and so worried. Hey, God is bigger than it and he's able to solve it. And that's why we need to learn how to uplift God. Second thing that needs to happen in the prayer meeting, you need to uplift God, not just for who he is, but you need to uplift him for all he's done. Now, you need to go into the Bible, go into history, go into your life, specifically go into the lives of those that you know, and you need to recite back what God has done so that you begin to realize that if he's done things and solved problems and worked miracles and did healings and raised people from the dead and gave financial, but everything that God has done in the past, guess what? He is also able to solve this problem because he solved people's problems in the past. Praise God. And the more that you look and see that God has solved problems, God has done great things, your faith begins to rise because you realize he's done it before. And guess what? He's going to do it again. Yeah, ma'am. And number three, the third thing that needs to happen in that prayer meeting is you need to reiterate God's promises. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse nine. What they did was they talked about how if disaster and the soul or war, pestilence and famine would come, that they were to go to the house of God and pray and God was going to fix it. When you look into the Bible and look into your church and your personal life and you see the promises that God has made you, this is why you got to have a prayer life. you got to have a personal walk with God before things happen because what happens in that personal walk with God, you make promises to God, God makes promises to you, and then when you get in trouble, guess what? God is there for you, but you've got to be there for God before the problem happens because you don't want to be in a situation where you don't have any credit built up. And then all of a sudden you need God to do something in your life, but you've never done something for him. Maybe God will bless you. Maybe he won't. But when you got a track record, that's why in, in our in our natural world, we have a credit history, a credit report. So that when you need a credit card or to buy a house or buy a vehicle, people can look at your track record and see how good you are in paying money back, how good your promises are. And then all of a sudden, when you there's something that you need. People look at the track record and say, oh, well, this person's got a good history. We can trust them. Hey, we've got no problem doing something big for them because they're going to pay us back. It's the same thing in the spiritual with God. you got to build up a history where you're serving God, working with the church, working with the ministry, paying your tithes, giving your offering, doing what you can for the church and the people of God so that God knows that you're reliable so that once he solves your problem, you don't run away and go back to who you were again. When you reiterate God's promises, it shows that you trust in God's word. Amen. All right. Now, the fourth thing that needs to happen when you're facing overwhelming odds, you need to tell God 
what the problem is. Now, notice that you don't start off telling God what the problem is. You seek God, you get everybody together, you pray and you fast, you uplift God, you worship him. And because there are things, when, when you go into the bank, you don't just go in and say, I need money. You describe the situation. What's your plan? What are you going to do? And it's the same thing when you're talking to God in prayer. And Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 11, they said, Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out. This is six verses in into Jehoshaphat's prayer. And so describe to God what the problem is. That's not, and that's not to help God. God knows what the problem is, but that's to help you look step by step what the situation is, because sometimes we just react out of emotion, and our emotional reaction doesn't fix it, doesn't solve it. We react emotionally, doing the first thing that comes to our mind, and then a lot, most of the time, we mess up trying to fix it. But when we sit down, and when we're describing what the problem is, and talking it out, everybody gets to see all the angles of what the situation is, that way, we're better able to handle it. Amen. Number six thing that needs to happen, we need to ask God to solve the problem. And in asking God, we've got to admit our weaknesses. Jehoshaphat wasn't afraid to say, Lord, hey, what, what can we do? This thing is too big for us. And instead of being big, instead of trying to act like we're tough and we can handle everything, we need to say, God, I can't handle it, but you can. I want to put this in your hand because when we act big and bad, like we can handle everything, like we're tough, then we can't properly commit to God and put things in God's hands like we should because naturally we're going to try and handle it if we're not afraid of anything. We think that it's not, bi it's not bigger than us. So when the problem is too big for us to handle and we admit that, it's easier for us to put the problem in God's hand and let God solve it the way that he should solve. Amen. Number seven, we need to learn how to patiently, patiently, patiently wait for God to solve the problem and trust him. Praise God. We've got to learn. Amen. I'm going to say this again. We've got to learn how to be patient and wait. Our, most of our problem is, is that we want God to do things on our time and a lot of what God does in our entire life is getting us to recognize that we're not going to push God into doing something that he's not ready for and he doesn't want us to do what many times when God is allowing things, trouble and trials to come into our life he is trying to teach us patience he is trying to teach us how to wait patiently for him to solve the problem he is trying to teach us how to trust in him because even the best of us many times we don't especially as we get older and our finances get built up we learn to rely on our resources we learn to rely on people instead of and we rely less on god we rely less on the spiritual things and more on the natural thing so we've got to learn how to wait for God to solve the problem. Whether it takes a week, a month, three months, six months, a year. We got Instead of trying to do everything that we can do, we need to learn to only move when God directs us to move. And, we need to, and that's why we've got to learn how to pray and seek God and only move when God is directing us to move. And finally, number eight, we need to wait for God to speak. And when God speaks, as Second Chronicles 20 verse 14 says, when God spoke through the, the prophet, the man of God, Jehaziel, when the Spirit of the Lord came on us, when we wait for God to speak, this is usually going to be, and I'm talking about in a church, in a congregational setting, and not a personal setting, but, and, and again, if it's a personal setting, we got to wait for God to speak to us. When we're in a congregational church setting, we've got to learn to wait for God to speak through a person with a spiritual gift that has a background in God using them to speak through them. This is going to come through someone with a spiritual gift that usually has a gift of prophecy, interpretation of tongue, a word of wisdom, or word of knowledge. Now, I want to say this. This is why 
it's so important that we learn to develop spiritual gifts in the church. When people aren't seeking God for spiritual gifts, when the church does get into a difficult situation, then guess what? Now it's hard to hear from God. Now we're, we're, we're reaching, we're stretching, we're trying to solve things on our own, and we don't know with absolute certainty whether God is trying to speak to us or not. Then you're gonna, is, a lot of confusion is going to be sown because everybody's going to think that they know the right way to do things. There's going to be shouting, there's going to be arguing, people are going to be leaving the church. The church has got to take time when they're not trials, when they're not difficult problems, not difficult times, and, and people on their own have to listen to it when the man of God is teaching and talking about spiritual gifts. That's why we've got to take that on our personal time and learn how to seek God for spiritual gifts so that later in our personal lives, in our, in our church, congregational, group, social lives, our community, whatever the case is, at that point, then we can, set, then we can seek God. And hear from God through somebody that's got that prophecy, interpretation of tongues, word of wisdom, or word of knowledge. Amen. I want to go on and read through the rest of this. And I'm going to talk about three other things that also need to happen. And verse 13 says, Meanwhile, Oh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, and I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asa, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horror, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jericho. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Praise God, praise God. This is why I'm in the church. People like to talk about church is ridiculous, religion is dumb. But let me tell you, when the situation comes on, on your life, and something happens to you that is overwhelming, is too much for you to bear, and you can't handle it, what God will do is remove that fear. He'll let you know that the problem can be solved. He'll tell you what your future is going to be like. He'll, God will lay out a future for you that's going to show you a complete victory with the situation handled, and that, that he's going to take control over it. And this is why we need to learn how to be patient and seek God. This is why we need God. This is why we need the house of God. This is why we need the people of God. Praise God. When God spoke, he told them to stand firm, hold their position, which is wait and watch out for God to work on their behalf. You see, instead of them getting excited, making moves that's going to cause them further problem, God said, just wait. Sometimes we're waiting on God to tell us what to do, or we get so excited, we start making moves on our own. We make the problem worse than what it was in the beginning. But sometimes God need to calm us down and say, just get somewhere, sit down, be patient, and wait, and, and I'm going to work this out. Many of uh, Much of the time that we go through a trial and tribulation is not going to be us doing something to make it better. It's going to be us waiting for God to make it better, waiting so that our patience gives us trust in the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Next, I'm going to read Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 18 through 23. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 18 through 23. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Levites, Kohathites, Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, 
for the God of Israel with a very loud noise. Now, just to explain something, the Korhathites, the Kohathites, and the Korhites, they were a group of Levites or priests that their sole job was to worship God with singing. So they are like what we would call a choir today. Verse 20, they rose early in the morning, went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. When they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and have us in Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. We got to learn how to believe in God and trust God, but we got to also learn how to believe in the ministry and trust in the ministry. And what does it say, verse 20? You will have success. Verse 21, when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy tire as they went before the army. That was the uh, Kohathites and the Korahites. And say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Moab, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men in Moab, of Ammon and Moab, rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction, and they made an end of the inhabitants of Mount Seir. They helped to destroy one another. God had the enemy that came against the people of God, ended up destroying themselves, and the people of God didn't have to do anything. Three things that happened that they did. And maybe you could say that there's 11 things that need to happen, but in addition to the eight things, number one, they worship God in prayer. Again, they devoted people just to sing and worship. And that's why worship and, and prayer is so important in our church services when we get together for prayer that we need to dedicate to people just to worship God. A lot of times it happens spontaneously, but we need to take time to devote with instruction on what needs to happen instead of everybody just doing their own thing. We need to specific, specifically direct people to what they need to do and worship in worshiping God and praising God so we can get a specific result. Number two, we have to believe in God and his ministry and his prophets. And sometimes people are just trusting God and they don't want to hear with the man of God, with the woman of God, or with somebody that has a word of wisdom or what a word of knowledge said. But God said, they said, believe, he said, believe in God and his prophets and you're going to have success. We're talking about how to manifest a miracle. There are different things we need to do if we want to have success. And a lot of people aren't seeing miracles and success in their life because they're not following God in the steps that they need to follow. And number three, they worship God specifically with singing. We got to make time for worship and praise through song and through singing in order to get the victory. Praise God. Now let's look at the result. The result, number one, when they prayed and sought God and worshiped God and followed instructions, God defeated Israel's enemies without them even having a fight. Secondly, God caused the enemy to destroy themselves. Thirdly, they were increased with a large financial blessing. The Bible talks about how afterwards the people, they went and found great spoil and great riches. And they earned, a risk. number four, they earned the respect, admiration, and security from the people in the countries around them. And that's talked about Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 29 through 30, where they had rest, they had security. So the people that came against them initially they know they didn't have to worry about fighting these people, but not just them. Everybody else around them said, whoa, we don't want to mess with these people. These are godly people. God's on their side. We're going to leave them alone. And, and in conclusion, what Jehoshaphat and Israel saw as an overwhelming, potentially destructive trial, God turned it into a blessing. That number one, it improved their financial status. Number two, it gave them peace, security, respect from those around them. And many times, God allows trouble to come into our life, things that we don't understand, situations that seem impossible, overwhelming, so that number one, we can see God's power. 
So number two, we can see God's prosperity come into our lives. Number three, so that God can increase our faith and our faithfulness to him and to the house of God. And finally, so that God can put us in a better situation that we're, than what we were in before. Praise God. Amen. You know, it's tough when trials come on our life and we're facing something that just brings us to tears, that potentially thinks that our life is going to be over. Something changes our life. It, it, it attacks us. It attacks our family. And we need to learn how to overcome these situations. We need the miracle of God to come. And when I'm talking about a miracle, I'm talking about God reversing the situation that if we try to do it on our own, it would be completely impossible. But we need a time for God to manifest a miracle and save us, praise God, so that we can see his power, so that God can bring prosperity to our life, so that he can give us security. And what that prosperity and security is going to do, it's going to hold back other potential problems. It's going to increase our status, how we live our life. It's going to bless us and bless our family, praise God. It's going to increase our faith and our faithfulness so that when other situations come, we're going to easily dispatch them. We're going to easily solve it because we've got faith and we've got faithfulness in God because many of us, our faith and our faithfulness isn't where it needs to be. And that's why God allows a situation to come into our life. And many times God wants to put us in a better situation than where we are right now, but it, it may take a trial to come to disrupt where we are. And what's going to happen is God's going to uproot us, and when we go through that trial, we're going to end up better than we were before. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you like this video, please take time to like and subscribe to the channel, and I hope that this will help to manifest a miracle in your life. You need help from God. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name.